Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's good to be with you guys. Let's stand together and worship. Isn't the church just so much more beautiful with a Christmas tree in the lobby, greenery on stage as we celebrate this Christmas season? Listen, my name is Dylan Medlin, and I'm the student pastor here, and it is my joy just to be able to welcome you here this morning. Um, I really just want to take just a few moments just to really brag on our student ministry, um, really as one student in particular, if I can, just, just this morning. Um, it was a few weeks ago that I found myself sitting in a small group classroom of sixth grade guys. And as we began to sit in this classroom and we began to talk, um, it came up in our conversation that one of the guys there did not have a Bible. And so as that, as that came, uh, came up and happened, I said, hey, listen, I'll take care of it. I'll get you a Bible. Um, but it was a few weeks later that I was approached by another student and said, hey, is that student there, um, that, is he here that didn't have a Bible? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. Let's go, let's go see if we can find him and, and we'll see. I said, why are you asking? Well, he begins to tell me, he goes, well, look, 
I, I went home. I told my mom that I really wanted to get him this Bible. And I wanted to be the one to give him his very first Bible. And these are sixth graders. Um, and I just, well, I just rejoice um, of what the Lord is doing in our student ministry and throughout our church as a whole. But um, they're literally just meeting the needs of the people of those around them, sixth graders. And so um, I hope your heart is rejoiced as much as mine is and has been um, throughout this week, um, throughout this month, really. But uh, it's really all the announcements that I have. Um, and so we have a few videos that we want you to check out. We're so excited for the upcoming holiday season. We'll be having a special Christmas celebration at our regular service times, 9 and 1030 a.m. on Sunday, December 24th. These will be family-friendly services, but Hope Point Kids will be available for children 5K and under. We hope you'll come and enjoy some great Christmas music and a special baptism service with your family and invite your friends and neighbors too. We want to invite all ladies from high school and up to join us for a special Christmas fellowship on Thursday, December 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at Hope Point. Bring a friend and join us as we celebrate the birth of our King. No registration is required for this event. Join us for our drop-in monthly prayer gathering on Wednesday, December 6th from 11.30 to 1 p.m. Come link arms to lift up our church, our city, and the nations. That's all for now. Enjoy the service, and we're glad you're here. Yeah, would you guys stand with us? And I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. And as I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence and I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And I believe that the start falling when they fall down on our knees i believe that the lake will go walking in the blind
stars in the wintry sky. Joy of the Father, reach through the darkness, shine across the earth, send the shadows to flight. Light of the Father, thank you for the privilege of saying hallelujah. Thank you for the, the tongue that can say, we praise you, Lord. I thank you for the water bottle in my hand, all the electronics that have already, the guitars, keyboards, drums, have, along with the beauty of vocal cords, and the large gathering of your people have already elevated our worship. We do not deny the fact that it is hard for some to come today here. Just so much uh, oppression, so many obstacles, unknowns. Thank you, God, that we can come and say we want to believe. We do believe. Help our unbelief. Father, would you take our eyes today off of the, these things that are, 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 are smaller 
in comparison to the glorious Christ who is returning uh, maybe before the service is over uh, for us. Uh, He will because he promised he would. Help us today, Lord, no matter what else is happening and has happened, we would be encouraged, overjoyed, emboldened by the very fact that you are in the process of returning. Help us to be ready, to be working, to use using the resources of our life, our worship, all of it matters. All of it matters, whether we know it or not. So use this message and the listening of your people because today matters. It matters. Calls it to matter by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I feel like I have seen um, just about every site on the streets of India since I've been in and out of that country since 1996. One of my favorite uh, sites, though, is, is known as the uh, Bharat. It's a wedding festival, and uh, it's a beautiful thing how the bride is at the location where the wedding is going to take place, and the groom uh, arrives on a beautiful white horse. Um, Tradition says, especially hundreds of years ago, that he had to ride for several days to get there to prove his loyalty to his bride. Last week, we saw a great wedding, but our focus last week was on the bride, the wedding that's going to happen in heaven between us, the church, and Christ. This week, we get to look at what does the groom look like, and he's introduced to us in Revelation 19. I saw heaven open, standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Just a few verses before that, last week we celebrated the invitation of God and his enabling us to be there at this wedding ceremony. Just review in case you weren't here last week, this is what we were happy about. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That would be the church. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Blessed are those who were invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. So that was the bride. That was the joy that we're going to experience for being there. And and I want you to know it's called the wedding supper, the wedding feast of the Lamb, because in order for us to have clean, white robes. Jesus Christ, Son of God, King of Kings, had to give his body on a cross in death like a sacrificial lamb would be slain and its blood poured on the altar in the Old Testament. We are there because Christ has paid for our admission as a sacrificial lamb that died on a cross. But when we come to the next section, we don't see him as a lamb anymore. We see him as a Warring king, verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is a picture of our groom. He was called a lamb earlier in the chapter, and now he's called a king because he's both. You can't know Christ without knowing that he's both. Here, he's a victorious king. In ancient Roman times, um, when a king would have victory in battle, and he had defeated at least 5,000 troops of the opposing army, he would be brought through the streets of Rome to be celebrated. In front of the parade would be all the captive uh, people from the other nation, then his troops who did the fighting, and then the Roman general who led the battle, and he would be in a chariot led by four white horses. It was called the Roman Triumph. This is what John is getting at in this thing, that the king has battled and won, and now he is being being celebrated. It's so interesting when you think about the the first and the second comings of Jesus. The first time he came, he did not ride on this white horse, but he rode on a donkey into Jerusalem on the last day or the last week of his earthly life. 
in order to demonstrate that he was going to submit completely to the Father in heaven and allow evil men and evil plans to take his life so he could become the sacrificial lamb. But when he returns, he's not riding on that donkey. He's riding on a mighty white stallion because now he's coming as king. You know, when you look in the Old Testament at the, the life of King David, he was Israel's greatest king, ruled for 40 years, and he uh, led Israel to battle and kept the nation safe for, for those 40 years through eight or nine really mighty, intense wars. And so we know David is king, but I know also tomorrow some of you will be reading the Bible and you'll open up to the book of Psalms because David, the king, was also a very gentle man, a writer of poetry, and wrote 73 of the Psalms, such as Psalm 23, where David calls himself a lamb. The Lord is my shepherd. So David, who is sort of an image of the Christ to come, is both a lamb and a king. And when you want to know Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, you have to know him as a gentle lamb and a warrior warrior king. And on his thigh are written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Um, verse 11 basically sets the tone for the entire section that we're looking at today. Actually, verse 11 helps us understand why we had four hallelujahs, four praise the lords last week, because here we see the arrival of the king of glory. You're probably uh, you've probably said it yourself. You've probably heard others say it. You may have said it to others. Where you see some gross injustice, it may be here and you know, locally, it may be nationally, it may be on the international scene, and you just sit there and say, somebody ought to do something. <laughs> and we say that because we know that somebody somewhere has been endowed with power, either through their, you know, they've been raised up as a businessman or a politician. They have the power to do something, but they're not using their power to bring about justice, and they could. So we just get frustrated. Somebody ought to do something. Well, it's really a double sorrow when that happens because number one, we see the just injustice and then we see somebody who has the power to do something, they're doing nothing. Well, here, the Bible says there's coming a day when a man on a white horse arrives from heaven and he's going to do something, the thing that we're all longing for. You remember when Jesus uh, died on the cross, rose from the grave, he spent six weeks with his disciples and then he ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and he, he just was taken up into the clouds and then two angels came and were, had a conversation with the disciples who were watching all of this and they said, this Jesus whom you saw go into the clouds will one day return in the same manner. Heaven, the clouds will be open and the king will come back and that's the fulfillment of the Acts 1 promise here in Revelation chapter 9, and when he comes back, he is going to do something. We've all been longing for that. I grew up in the 70s, and sort of a cultural icon of the 70s was a, a guy named Billy Jack. <laughs> he uh, was a, a former Green Beret, uh, half Navajo, Native American, and he uh, had a real heart for the vulnerable and the weak, uh, that were part of the reservation where he, where he lived. And you could sort of, all the movies were sort of predictable that whether it was the local sheriff or his thug son <laughs> were going to try to hurt these people on the reservation. And right when they were humiliating these, these sweet, sweet people, uh, Billy Jack would show up. <laughs> and uh, he was an expert in martial arts and he would do some major damage and everybody in the movie was thrilled. <laughs> Because we long for somebody to come and do something. It's your, if you, if, because you're wired in the image of God, you have this longing for justice. And God says, one day, I'm going to send my son to be a rider on a white horse who's going to bring about perfect justice. You know, the only people who don't care about justice in this world are criminals uh, and people who live quiet lives in suburbs in the West. But the rest of the world is longing for justice because of the injustice they're a part of. Well, we know that 
you know, Jesus is capable of, that he's going to do exactly as I said. He will bring about justice because of his name here, uh, Faithful and True, has about four different titles in this section of Revelation. And this was Faithful and True, which simply means he's going to do what he promised. If you ask me, do I know some things for certain in life? I, I do know this. He is coming back because he's true. He's faithful. Whatever he said that is going to happen, he's, he's, he's going to do. We saw beginning in Revelation 12 and 13, we are opposed by one who's called the beast who does nothing but lie to us and culture right now is following him, believing that Jesus Christ is secondary or maybe not that, and the beast is primary, that sin is better than Jesus. And they believe the lies. Jesus is faithful and true and whatever he says is going to happen. He, Jesus came to tell us the truth about God, the truth about ourselves, and the truth about the way, the only way to know God. We, we saw that in John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am truth. I don't just speak truth. I am the embodiment of truth. Uh, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father through me. So this is his claim that I can, and I'm the only one who can take you to heaven. And then a few verses earlier is when he promised, I'm going to do that. I am going to take you there. John 14, 2, my father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Question mark shouldn't be there, sorry. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. So the reason that we know that this promise that he made, he's going to keep is because he's, He's kept the other 8,800. There are 8,800 promises by God for you, the believer, in the Bible. And the New Testament says that all of them are answered with a yes in Christ in 2 Corinthians. So he is, if he said he's coming back to take us to a place that he's prepared for us in heaven, he will. Nobody other than Jesus says that better Remember, I'm old, and I just have to, I told you about Billy Jack. Now I'm going to tell you that every so often I just need some 1970s funk in order for me to appreciate the reality of this, and nobody does it better than Andre Crouch. Boy, did I, I wore that out this week. I, I just <laughs> loved that, dancing around the den. He's coming back for me. Why, why do I know that? Because he said he would. I can get depressed about all sorts of things. I can doubt all, like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And I never, I've met believers who've suffered the worst losses in the world. And sometimes it's really dented their faith in terms of their enjoyment of God. But I've never met a true spirit-filled Christian who ever has doubted the return of Christ. When you're born again, you know he's coming back. It's, you can't wait for it. It is the absolute hope of your life. If he promised a feast, he's going to bring you to that, that feast. You know, when I preach on messages like this in Revelation, uh, and it's going to get intense toward the end. Sometimes the, it can get narrow and narrower on stage of those who might support this type of teaching. Um, and no matter how narrow my f field of support has gotten in life through the 37 years of ministry, I've never doubted at all uh, the return of Jesus Christ. I know he's coming back because he he said he would. And there's not going to be one person that he fails to address. Revelation 19, 12, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. So he's going to bring about perfect justice because he sees perfectly. No one can hide from his heart piercing gaze. He knows right now everything in your heart. 
So when he comes back, the reason why justice is perfect is because he sees perfectly. And the reason why he's going to be able to bring about perfect justice is because of his authority. Whatever he sees, he can do because of the many crowns on his head. You remember when we met the Antichrist in Revelation uh, chapter 13, he had 10 crowns. Jesus has innumerable crowns. The devil has some authority. Jesus has all authority. And that's why he will be able to do exactly what's on his heart and what his eyes see need to be done. Matter of fact, the authority and the radiance and the glory of Christ is so great that you and I are going to be astonished that we went, oh my, we underestimated how wonderful he is. This is what the writer says means in verse 12. He has a name written on him. No one knows but himself. The Bible is loaded with titles about Jesus. He has a lot of titles in the Bible. That's why we love that Christmas tree in the lobby. You can look at all the ornaments. They're just the names of Jesus. We have a, a smaller version of that at our house in our sunroom. And here's some of the names of Jesus on that tree. Creator, Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, Emmanuel, Holy One, Light of the World, Lion of Judah, Good Shepherd, Bread of Life, Living Water, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. And so here in Revelation 19, the Bible is telling us that um, whatever you thought you knew about Jesus, you are going to be very surprised of how much greater he is. More glorious, more powerful, more loving, more peace-giving, more satisfying, and that's why there is one more name that if you added up all the names in the Bible, even they cannot give you an adequate description of what you are about to experience when he parts the eastern sky. Unfortunately, the lost world also underestimates Jesus. That's described in the next verse. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. Uh, has four names in Revelation 19. One of them is the Word of God, which be, would be a reminder. The reason why, you know, how do you know that he's going to be able to do all this is because, uh, remember, the Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. It was talking about Jesus. And it says, all things were created by the Word. Hebrews 1 says Jesus Christ is, by the word of his mouth, sustains all things. It's the reason why you're glued to your seat today, because gravity is holding you down at 9.8 meters per second squared. And it's, that's the only reason you're not floating. He sustains all things by his word, creates, so that's why he is able to enact this final victory. Now, the victory that he's going to enact in, is in going, involved the... Uh, The fighting against and the defeating of all of his enemies. That's why his robe is blood-soaked in verse 13. Some people, not a lot of people, but some people believe this is a reference to the blood that was on the robe of Jesus because he died for the world's sin. Glorious truth is why we're getting to heaven. But this time when he comes back, it is not to bleed this is speaking of the blood of his enemies. And we know that because verse 15, we'll just combine these two. Verse 15 is at the bottom. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Again, this is still talking about the rider on the white horse, Jesus, that when he comes, in, in ancient times, uh, people would go pick the grapes out of their vineyard, bring them and put them in a vat, and then somebody would take off their sandals and they would walk all over the grapes in order to squish them and get the juice out that would later be turned to, to wine. And when they were squishing those grapes, their, the bottom of their robe would be saturated with grape juice and it would look just like blood. And so when the Bible says that Jesus treads the wine press of God's fury, it's talking about Jesus conquering all those who rebelled against him. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His judgment will be worldwide in scope. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword 
with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. Um, so I... We have many nations that come to this church. Uh, just met a new young man that the first service from Morocco and uh, haven't met anybody from Morocco. Grateful, so grateful he was here. We have you know, people from South America, Central America. We have them from Eastern Europe, Central Asia. But the Bible says... Jesus Christ will judge all nations and all people in those nations who believed that the beast and the false prophet, um, the harlot of Babylon and all of the glimmering sensual offers of culture were better than him and re rejected him and he's going to, every person in every nation will fall under this judgment. And it's very interesting that there will not be one weapon that he uses that is man-made. The, the world's going to be gathered around him and around his church at this time with tanks and guns and missiles and submarines and aircraft carriers. All the final battle attempting to destroy all that God values. And Jesus will simply use one weapon, a sword that comes out of his mouth and will destroy the whole world. It's amazing. And you say, well, well, why does Jesus need to rule? That's, that's really a fulfillment of Psalm 2 there at the end. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Why, why does he have to rule his kingdom or lead his kingdom with force? Because that's the only kind of kingdoms that survive. Um, if a nation uh, says that if a nation is going to survive, that nation has to be sovereign. For a nation to be sovereign, it has to be able to uh, protect and defend its borders. And so uh, the very first uh, promise of the federal government to you who live in America in the preamble of the Constitution is that uh, you, the citizens of this land, will be protected from uh, foreign and domestic enemies. And if the government cannot keep that promise, we're not a sovereign nation and we'll be defeated. So... The reason why Jesus Christ rules with power is because up until now in the book of Revelation, we have seen that Satan has been given a fair amount of power from uh, Jesus. Remember, Satan has the uh, 10 crowns, he has some authority, some power, and Satan has been using all of that to try to destroy the church. So that's what he's allowed to do now. We, we saw this battle beginning really uh, at, at Christmas time 2,000 years ago. Revelation 12, when Jesus was born, there was a giant red dragon, that would be Satan, uh, with seven heads. He stood in front of the woman who was ready to give birth so he could eat her baby as soon as it was born and her child was taken up to God and to his throne. So really sort of a masterful summary here of the life of Jesus Christ. Mary, or Israel, giving birth to Jesus Christ for the world's salvation, Herod, led by Satan's you know, demon, uh, demon, demon lust, demon motivation to try to kill Christ when he was born, and he missed that. And then Jesus went all the way through the cross, rose from the grave, and then ascended to heaven. All of that's in that verse. So Satan could not destroy Christ, uh, but because of that, then he took out his wrath against people that Christ loved, the church. Revelation 12, 17, then the dragon was very, very angry at the woman, and he went off to make war against all her other children, those who obey God's commands and who have the message Jesus, um, Jesus taught. So this is what Satan has been doing from Revelation 12 to this morning, Waging war against the church, against your faith, attempting you to, for you to walk away, deny, doubt, and just, just fall away. Uh, and he would be successful at that, he would, if Jesus Christ did not return. We would eventually just lose our faith. He's not going to let that happen, so he's coming back. Let's start with verse 11 and go to verse 14, combine these two, how this is going to happen. 
I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. Here's, here's the kicker. Verse 14, this is us. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Where, where did we see that description? That was last week. Those are the, that's the church that's invited to the wedding feast. Believers who've been cleansed. We're going to be part of this final great battle. Jesus in front, we're in the back. He's on obviously a huge horse and we're on our horses all decked out. And we're going, to, and that's, he's protecting us and that's why we're going to win. If you want to know, you know how all of these verses that talk about the end times fit together, This description in Revelation 19 is the same one that many of you have read before in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 about the return of Christ. They're the same event. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Sleep is always a term in the Bible to talk about death because it's restful. So the Bible says whoever you know or read about that's, that's died, they're with Christ, and they will be part of this return battle in Revelation 19 on a horse. But they're, they're not the only ones who are going to be part of that battle. Look at us, if we haven't died yet. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel. See a lot of those in Revelation. And with the trumpet call of God, we've seen the seals, trumpets, and the bowls. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that... We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And when you combine that with Revelation 19, that's just a promise that you're joining them in the battle, the final battle. Riding back on that white horse behind the rider of the white horse. But everybody's not going to be in that battle. Everybody's not going to be riding with Christ. Everybody's not going to be on a white horse. Everybody's not going to be dressed in fine linen. Because the the war that Jesus is uh, waging against the world will be those who rejected him. And it will be a terrible day. Not a glad day, but a terrible day. Revelation 19, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. From time to time, when I'm standing out front between the services or after this one, a uh, beautiful little child might come to me from HP Kids of whatever the Bible lesson was that day, and they'll be running out, and they'll show me their piece of paper. Uh, sometimes it's something they colored. The, in, in 20 years here, 37 total, no child has ever bought me a picture where they colored of the birds of the air eating the flesh of people. <laughs> but it's a Bible scene. And like I said, you can't know Christ unless you know him as a sacrificial lamb and a warrior king. You know, last week in Revelation, as I've alluded to today, we talked about the marriage feast of the lamb and what a blessing it is to be invited to that. So there are two invitations that go out to humanity to two feasts. You can either come to the feast of the lamb, the marriage ceremony of the lamb, and have a meal that Jesus has prepared for you. Or you can reject that invitation. And the second invitation is for you where you yourself are the meal that the birds of the air will eat, slain in battle. You have to decide which meal you're coming to based on your decision to worship or not worship Jesus Christ. 
Now, you would think a warning like that, as sobering as it is, would cause people to fear and tremble. It, it does me, uh, but not the world. The, the world, deluded, deceived by Satan, still believes there is no judgment to come, that there's no final day of accounting. The world truly believes that. So they're going to continue to resist until the final day. Look at the world here. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. Their armies were gathered together to make war against the rider uh, on the horse and his army. No matter how many great sermons have been preached throughout history on the warning that God so loves, uh, is so loving that he gives to the world. Don't believe it. They're ready for battle and believe they'll defeat Christ um, and his church and the righteousness uh, of this Savior. Now, it looks like um, that when we're living on earth now, that it looks like we, sometimes it looks like this group of people are winning. You feel that. It does. It's probably why you're like me. I maybe watch maybe one hour of news a month, less than maybe probably. It just seems hopeless. So these armies started gathering in Revelation 16. We called that the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16. Then we took a two-chapter parenthesis break, and then now we pick back up. And so this is the battle that began at the end of Revelation 16 and turned out to be that the beast didn't win. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf with these signs, he had deluded those who received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. You know, a lot of times when you read about uh, something like this in the book of Revelation, you, you, you have to ask, you know, what's the purpose of it? Why? And but to get that, you really need to go back to the uh, first readers. Remember, these are real people who lived in the first century. They were part of seven churches that, uh, that they lived in what is now modern day Turkey. And you say, why would John have written this to them? Well, they were just getting demolished. And so, number one, I, I think that, you know, he's probably telling them, you know, victory is coming, but I think even more than that, he's telling them, because this is going to happen to your enemies, you can be filled with grace in your response to everyone that rejects your witness for Christ, because no injustice will ever go unchecked by Christ when he returns. You don't have to carry the weight of hating. You don't have to carry the weight of being a vigilante. You have to carry the weight of being vindictive. Uh, Miroslav Wolf is a writer. He, he followed his people. In, he was born in Croatia. He followed the Croatians, uh, their demise when Serbians came in and just ransacked the country with all of their, uh, their burning, their killing, and their raping. And he, he wrote a book on how the Croatians were able to live without a vigilante spirit. How were they able to respond with grace to their enemies. And this is the thesis of the book. He, he says this is my thesis. My thesis is that the practice of nonviolence requires belief in divine vengeance. And, you know, a lot of people, again, like I said, so many people want to get more biblical than the Bible. They say, is that true? It's like, does, does my belief in the vengeance of God to come, is that supposed to help me? Yes. It sets you free from having to be an angry person. You can be a grace-filled person because justice is not up to you. I, I think somebody else said something like that. Romans 12, the Apostle Paul, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. How liberating it is that knowing that God will take care of all the injustice of the world, uh, he will do something, and he will do something, he will do something final. Now back to our, 
One of our final verses in verse 20, we see the beast, and the false prophet, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. We met them, remember we met them in chapter 12 and 13, and the reason why they are getting tossed in the lake of fire is because of this right here. The false prophet uh, used all of his power to deceive and to delude uh, this world and to convince them that the beast was more worthy of worship than Jesus Christ. So the false prophet was the propaganda arm of the institution of the beast, which is just a big giant glob of demonic power. So <clears throat> who's going to be thrown into the lake of fire in the end times? Well, obviously the Antichrist, which is the demonic organization or group of organizations, institutions that seek to be worshipped above Jesus. And then all of the deceptive institutions, ministries, and churches that join the false prophet and taught a false message and deceived the world that was asking for hope. And so we have a lot of false prophets, a lot of false teachers, a lot of false preachers, a lot of false churches, a lot of false ministries that are joining with the false prophet and all of those organizations will be tossed into the lake of fire on the final day because they deceived instead of told the truth. So in this chapter, the beast and the false prophet go to their doom Next chapter, chapter 20, which we'll probably save for the new year, uh, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, just so you can understand, yes, I know that I probably am in the 1% right now who would begin December by teaching the next section of Revelation here. Even if it weren't December, I would imagine that 99% of preachers in the state would probably never choose to preach on this passage, but instead would work as hard as they could during the week to devise clever words to cause people to like them and to like their church and to not tell the whole picture of Jesus Christ who is a sacrificial lamb and a warrior king. So even though this is not easy to say, it is exactly what Jesus wants us to know about him. But you have to have, be willing to tell the truth even with a few minutes of difficult conversation. But if you love people, you'll tell them the whole truth about Jesus. If you don't love them, love yourself more, you'll withhold something so they'll like you. Our life was changed as a family this year with the purchase of a Blackstone grill. <laughs> I, our marriage was saved. Um, I am now regarded in my home as a culinary hero because I no longer burn chicken and I can even cook vegetables on the grill. And it's a, it's a griddle, it's a flat griddle, so you don't see flame and therefore it's, uh, you don't burn things and dry them out like I used to for all of our all of our life. And so I am, I'm pretty good uh, and I've you know, got some pride about it, but I'm, I could invite you over today with confidence that it's gonna go well. But there is a problem with the Blackstone and that is my little three-year-old grandson, Wells, doesn't really understand the danger of it because he doesn't see any fire. So when he comes over, he wants to touch it. So he's tried it, you know, or gotten walking in that direction as I'm grilling. So the last time he was here, two weeks ago, I had to tell him the truth about the grill. So I grabbed him as he was walking toward it, and I hugged him tight enough to know, this is serious, you're not getting away. Gently enough to know, I love you. That kind of hug. And then I laid down on my back, sort of shimmied over to the bottom of the grill, holding wells, and pointed up so he could see the flame. 
so he could see the danger. So then I said, Wells, this grill is good. It's where Rich cooks grilled cheese sandwiches for you. It's a good, life-giving grill. But it is also dangerous. And so if you want to be a faithful evangelist, you tell the world, Jesus is good and Jesus is dangerous. He's so good that instead of us being uh, judged with the world, instead of the world being judged, he comes and dies on the cross and sheds his blood so that we could have clean, righteous robes to wear and be invited to the lamb. That's how good he is. Plus, he gave you this morning coffee, water, and whatever you're going to eat this afternoon. Everything comes out of his hand. He's good, benevolent, but he's also dangerous because if you say that it was no big deal for God, listen, if you walked into a courtroom and watched a judge that day hear 20 cases no matter what degree of evil it was involved, and he dismissed all of them and prosecuted no one, you would say that judge is a wimp, that he doesn't love righteousness because nothing bothers him. Everybody goes. So if God were to have written all the 39 books of the Old Testament filled with hundreds and hundreds of laws where he expresses how holy he is, then if we get to the New Testament and God says, just kidding, no one's gonna be judged for violating all those laws, you would say God is an unrighteous judge. And holiness means nothing to him. So the very fact that God judges means he is righteous and all of his laws mean something to him. And if you look at this righteous judge who gave his son to die for our sins on the cross, and you go to that judge and say, I think your son is not worthy of my devotion not worthy of my obedience. It's just like spitting in the face of a king or spitting in the face of a judge, which is not a good thing to do. And that's why God judges. I held my grandson and showed him the flame because I love him. I told him the truth. The most loving thing we can do with this world is to tell them the truth Sacrificial lamb, warrior king, invites you to the marriage supper of the lamb. The most loving thing we can do is tell the truth, which is summarized so well in Psalm 2. Serve the Lord with fear, celebrate his rule with trembling, kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the refuge of Jesus. We picture ourselves inside uh, the safe walls uh, of a city uh, that cannot be penetrated by evil, violence. We're safe from not only the attacks of others, we're, we're safe from the condemning voice of Satan that tries to remind us of our past. We have refuge in Jesus. He has forgiven us. He has held us with a more loving, tight embrace than I would ever be able to hold my grandson with. He will never let us go. Even on the days where we try to squirm, he's going to make sure that we Don't go to the flame. Thank you, Jesus, for being our refuge, for holding us, for coming to us. I pray today, God, that somebody in this place would say, I want to be part. They would believe that your words are true, Jesus. That they would say, I want to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want to be part of that feast. I want to be part of that meal that God provides for me forever and ever and ever infinite satisfaction, infinite joy, eating with Jesus forever. Lord, would you persuade someone today to believe there's only terror at the other meal where the birds of the air 
will eat those who die in battle. Father, move somebody today from one battlefield to the other. From a battling, from battling you to surrendering to you, from opposing you to worshiping you, from embracing sin to confessing sin. And may today they find refuge in the life and the death and the resurrection of the returning King, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand again with us? As always right now, we want to give you an opportunity to pray with someone. We'll have a prayer team to my right at these doors, and we would love to give you the opportunity this morning. generations of falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe we sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all parts and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry
calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who to do the same thing for me, for me, for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing
you're freeing hearts right now you are the same god you are the same god you touch the lepers then and i feel your touch right now you are the same god you are the same god never changing you are forever I'm calling on the Holy Spirit Almighty River come and fill me again Come and fill me Come and fill me again. May we be filled with the Spirit as we go now. We love you, church. We'll see you next time.